So today is a sick ass day. We've been waiting for this day for a long time. Today, we're gonna talk about all the conspiracy theories, homie. We got a whole chart to go through. We'll talk about ancient extinct beavers with shells the size of small houses. We'll talk about the pyramids and how they got built by alien laser beams. We'll talk about all of this cool shit. We will talk about the moon landing. We're talking about all of it today, baby. We're getting to everything, but first, if we're gonna talk about conspiracy theories and get down into the fun fun, we gotta talk about the most basic principles of how to understand information, how to rationally judge your sources, how to think about thinking, first and foremost. I think this is the most important episode yet and it's one of my favorite things to think about and to talk about. I think about this all the time and this is fundamental to how I think about everything. This is thinking about how to think about thinking. Let's, let's roll the intro and get going. American conspiracy theories are dangerous. Information is the oxygen of a democracy. Republicans, with progressives, with libertarians, because this is not about right and left, this is about right and wrong. It's so sick that we can't talk about it. It actually lifted up, and it could actually turn. I'm gonna ask you to look away. What's up? Before we can get to Deep State and George Soros and Jewish space lasers or whatever else is in here, we got to start with the basics. What is science and how does it work? And one popular misunderstanding about science is to insist that science is right, full stop, and that once we discover the truth about the world, we're done. And anyone who would deny such truth is at best stupid or at worst ignorant and anti-Semitic and racist and whatever else. But even a modest familiarity with the history of science offers many examples of science that was settled and then had to be reopened. You can't see the whole quote, but all great truths begin as blasphemies. George Bernard Shaw. So let's go over a few blasphemies real quick. Like, A, the earth is round. And don't worry, flat earthers, don't worry. Don't get your panties all up in a bunch. We'll give you a fair shake. We'll give it a whole episode. Just give it some time. Darwin's theory of natural selection and evolution. That was ridiculed. Germ theory of disease. The first guy to suggest that, or at least one of the first, was so shunned and ridiculed throughout his life, he finished his life in an insane asylum. Ludwig Boltzmann suggested that, hey, maybe atoms and subatomic particles have a lot to do with the nature of reality. And he was so ridiculed that he took his own life. Science is never settled. Science is a process of learning and discovery. And sometimes we learn that what we thought was right is wrong. And this is just a very quick refresher, a reminder to you that if you're gonna learn something, you must not presume to already know the truth. The full cup can only overflow. So, empty your mind out a little bit, relax. Don't take anything too seriously. Don't take things too personally. When we discuss ideas, the ideas are external to us. If I'm going to discuss the theory of flat earth, it's not because I am a flat earther. It's because I'm a person and the idea of a flat earth is an idea that I am capable of engaging with with my brain. If you're going to discuss the idea that maybe the U.S. shouldn't spend hundreds of billions of dollars on war, and might spend more money on domestic problems at home, that doesn't necessarily mean that you believe that's true. You can discuss things you don't believe are true. You can think about things that you don't like. You can say things that aren't your opinion, believe it or not. So just let's start this whole discussion with a quick reminder that thinking is a thing you do with your brain Ideas are things we pass back and forth between each other, and we draw conclusions that can always evolve as we learn and get smart. So, we're going to start this episode with a really good, non-political, interesting example of a conspiracy theory that will help us unpack all of the things that I'm trying to unpack here. Um, Namely, ancient civilizations and ancient Egypt. And to start, I just want you to imagine that you were an archaeologist, a historian, a researcher, who had spent tens of thousands of dollars on going to school 
four years at least, you got a degree, you worked really hard, you're working as an archeologist now, you've dedicated 10, 20, 30 years of your life to advancing the study of Egyptology, and you have contributed to our general academic understanding of like that one king and that one tomb that had that one thing that you spent so much time researching all of the like historical texts and the religion, and you just were so specialized into that thing, you know everything there is to know about that one dude in that one cave in Egypt. You know what I mean? Like you're an expert, and your expertise is inevitably couched into all of the greater academic understanding of ancient Egypt and of ancient history and of your academic field. And then imagine that someone new comes along, maybe someone that doesn't even have a degree in this shit, walks along and comes up with a theory that's like, hey, actually, all of that is wrong. All of that is based on false assumptions and all of the theory, like literally everything that you have done with your life's work is wrong. How do you think you would respond? Would you be so quick to just throw out all of your life's work and pack it all up and give away all your credentials and be like, yeah, I just spent my whole life on the wrong thing. Even if you knew you were wrong, imagine how it would feel to know that you were wrong, right? Like, you see where I'm going here? This is a bias that I call the expert bias, which is that when a human being spends their time and their life becoming an expert at something, the more time they invest, the more resources they invest in becoming an expert, the more invested they are in being correct. This is a thing that all social media influencers deal with every day. I deal with it every day. I started out this account, all of my social media accounts started out very clearly as like, I don't know shit and I'm just a dude doing research and I'm learning as I go and I made tons of mistakes and I still do. And every day I have to remind myself not to become an expert because I don't know everything and I'm. It, it's so easy to fall into the trap of trying to tell people what's real and tell people what's right because I've done the research and now I know, but that's not true at all. I make mistakes in my research all the time. All of us do, even experts. And the moment you start thinking of yourself as an expert is the moment that the dude that walks into your surgery tent saying, hey, I think you should wash your hands because I think that there's these microscopic things called germs that are causing your patients to get sick and die. And you're like, go fuck yourself. I'm a surgeon and you're just some dude. Get out of here, right? So you can imagine that the surgeons of ancient Egypt, archeology, span were a little pissed off when some dudes started walking into their tent being like, yo, um, that whole like pyramid thing, you got that wrong. I don't think that any of it happened that way and you should rethink this entire ancient Egypt thing completely. They were understandably like, get the fuck out of here, man. And if you don't know what it is that I'm talking about, oh boy, do we have some stuff to talk about. If you have not yet heard of the younger dry ass empath hypothesis, ho oh ho, Boy, are we gonna talk about some shit today? It's, it's so crazy. It's one of my favorite theories in the world. I'm, I'm probably gonna write an entire book just about like ancient alternate histories just for fun, like a fiction book, just cause it's cool. But examining the evidence for the Younger Dryas Hypothesis and the implications for a lot of our understanding of history is a fascinating exercise in logical reasoning and in open-mindedness and in Examining the limits of what we do and do not really know about the universe. So let's talk briefly about the mainstream accepted theory of the evolution of humanity, society, culture, and civilizations. I'm not gonna go real deep into specifics. We're just gonna kind of cover the, the broad picture here. The out of Africa theory of human population spread. We're not necessarily clear on how humans came to be so damn smart compared to everybody else. That's not super clear. There's a lot of theories about like, maybe it's because we ate red meat, so our brains grew faster. Maybe it's because we learned to cook. So maybe it's because of protein development. Maybe it's because of like tool building and we just like opposable thumbs and everyone's got a theory. And let's be real, they all kind of like, a, they get some things, but there's like a lot of questions there that we'll talk about another time. Um, anyways, we'll probably talk about it later in this video. But the mainstream theory is that humans evolved into the advanced species that we are today down in Africa. and. That's based mostly on genetic carbon dating sorts of evidences whereby we can track fossils and DNA and we're just tracking back to like earliest known ancestors of humans to Africa who they spread out northwards and then you can see the different dates 45 ice these are all in millions of years ago uh KYA thousands of years ago yeah thousands of years ago millions of years ago would be a long time we'd be talking dinosaurs <laughs> anyways 
So they hop down to Australia, but you can see that like here, like they didn't get to Madagascar until 2000 years ago, but they were in Australia 65,000 years ago. And that's because like large expanses of water are hard to cross. But it's important to remember that sea levels have changed over time. We're gonna talk about one of them in a second here. And so there were land bridges through, for example, like the Philippines that don't exist today. There were land bridges here that don't exist today. So, so the theory here is that modern humans, more or less, were in Africa 200,000 years ago. They didn't get through the Sahara until much more recently. They didn't cross into the Americas until 16,000 years ago, named the Clovis people. They didn't cross down into South America until 14,000 years ago, and they didn't get to Hawaii until 1,000 years ago? 2,000, 3,000 years ago? 1,000 years ago is the earliest known people on New Zealand? That's just context. This is the mainstream accepted understanding of human evolution if you go to school and get a degree and enter a field of archaeology. This is based on things like the evolution of various different hominid species and how different fossils have shown the fossil record over hundreds of thousands, millions of years to evolve towards Homo sapiens. You know, and the generally accepted belief is that humans were mostly hunters and gatherers and nomadic peoples until ancient Egypt and the Fertile Crescent, people settled down and started producing modern agriculture, which allowed for cities to be developed. And no sooner were cities developed than did the ancient Egyptians start building really big, really technologically advanced pyramids. And I want to point out that it's not just that they started building really big pyramids, it's that the very first pyramid, this is a timeline right here, the very first ones they built were the biggest ones. And then as time progressed, the pyramids got smaller and smaller and less and less advanced. Just to clarify, that's the official story. So the first pyramids that were built were all right here at the start, all the biggest ones in a very short period of time. They were built using, you know, let's slow this down and go into that. These dudes did not have metal tools. It was before they understood bronze or steel or iron. They did not have wheels. There were no carts. There were no carriages. They were theoretically doing all of this work with like strange mechanical advantage things, ropes, levers, just shitloads of dudes. There's all sorts of theories about different kinds of ramps they build of all different sizes. And when I say there's all sorts of theories, I mean there's all sorts of theories because like no one knows how they built them and we're just speculating wildly at this point. And the reason why we're speculating wildly is because the actual like feat of construction that is even just one of these pyramids is unbelievably mind-blowingly complex. There are air shafts that run up through it. There is all kinds of magnetic and electrical properties based upon the stones that were used and how they're, they are like perfectly, there's so many pieces of this construction. Like a lot of people don't realize that the Great Pyramid of Giza is not a four-sided structure. It is an eight-sided structure because all four sides have a crease running down the center that is perfectly straight that like just barely cuts the shot, the, the face, rather than being flat, they're all just a little bit bent. And the, the, the level of complexity of build that that simple little thing does, it just immensely complexifies the entire structure. From an engineering standpoint, that is the dumbest thing you could ever do to a pyramid that was at first like a relatively straightforward thing to build, although it's not because of how precise they are. And then you do that and it's like, what the fuck are you doing? Like we literally, we do not have time to go into all of the amazing things about like how incredibly complex building these pyramids the way they did would be. There's tons of resources out on YouTube that you can do your own research about. Let's just suffice to say that these are absolute marvels of technology. And let's be clear, just speaking just about the Great Pyramid of Giza, which is apparently made by Khufu to be a tomb for Khufu, that one, it's important to clarify that the only reason why they think it's a tomb for Khufu is because of a little piece of like graffiti like scribbling of writing like inside of the king's chamber up in these secret chambers above it that were like not even discovered at first there was like a little inscription somewhere that like someone had scribbled on the rocks that's like the only marking in this entire pyramid this pyramid has no hieroglyphics in it no paintings nothing like what like modern egyptian like modern what nothing like what period Egyptian architecture looks like, where it's all covered in hieroglyphics and like art and religious symbology. The Great Pyramid of Giza, the big one, 
is just blank. It's just like a perfect stone construction. It, it, people walk that go through it, they describe it as feeling like you're walking through a machine. And, and all of that is just to establish that like this thing is crazy and we should be asking questions. And don't get it twisted. The level of science and detail that have gone into archeologists over time speculating as to these methods of building the pyramids is absolutely savage. It's so fucking wild. Just the number of like, like hours of labor that modern archeologists have devoted to trying to fucking uncover how they did this is mind blown. It's so cool, but they might all be wrong. And we're not even gonna go into this huge body of evidence that they might be wrong that's based off of these actual like technicalities about the construction process. We're gonna zoom out and look at the bigger picture. For the longest time, it was believed that these were the oldest megalithic structures in the world. Megalithic meaning they're built out of enormous stone blocks that are cut in these, in these similar ways. There's like megalithic structures all around the world that are made out of gigantic stone blocks that we don't know how they were built necessarily. They're all, they're all a little mysterious and they're pretty much all earthquake proof. So they're all still standing, kind of, kind of funny. It's important to remember that stones cannot be carbon dated. We can't tell when the stone was cut and placed there. So all stone structures like the pyramids, like Stonehenge, like all the temples across the Mayan civilizations and in Far East Asia in like Vietnam and Laos and Cambodia, all of those structures, they're only able to be dated based upon organic matter found within the structures or on the structures or around the structures. So they dated Khufu's pyramid it's actually that one, because Khufu claimed it was his during his times and because there's a little graffiti, but they, they can't actually tell when the stones were piled up because the stones are, you know, like a million years old. They're granite, it's, it, it's granite and sandstone, limestone. Like these stones can't be dated. So anyways, I'm getting distracted. For the longest time, the pyramids were the oldest megalithic structures in the world and there was nothing before them and that was the start of megalithic architecture and it became the storyline of like, Civilization evolved from hunter-gatherers into agricultural societies. They built up cities and those cities developed enough stability whereby they could have huge populations of workers that could work on enormous products for pharaohs for no reason other than the pharaoh's gigantic dick. And he would just build these huge fucking like hundreds of thousands of slaves working their entire lives to build these pyramids is the theory. That's how it worked. And it just, it evolved to that. And then they stopped doing that. And then they never did it again. And all around the world, they, we've discovered all sorts of crazy megalithic architect, architecture, pyramids of all shapes and sizes and all sorts. And they've all been prescribed to various cultures that we know of in recent times that must have built them. Either because they told us that they built them or because they explicitly told us that they didn't build them, but we needed an explanation. So we decided they did build them in some cases or just, you know, whatever evidence we could put together. It's like no one else ever lived in this Mayan place, so it must have been these Mayans that built that shit, because otherwise who would have built it? But the first one was Egypt, because it's the oldest one that we can date to a civilization that had cities and enough people to build it. And that was like, you know, 3000 BC was when they were building those pyramids. But then archeology, span archeology, and we discovered something older. Gobekli Tepe was actually discovered a while earlier and it had kind of gotten written off. I forget the exact story. It's kind of funny to look into, but they were like, yeah, it's probably nothing. And then later they were like, holy shit, dig, because they found these gigantic circles of these giant megalithic stones. And to be clear, like no one can really agree on what the hell this was or what happened here or whatever, but it's pretty clear that 13,000 years ago, a long time before the pyramids were built, this existed and was buried intentionally all at once. Sometimes when they find ancient archaeological sometimes when they find ancient archaeological sites, it has been buried over time, like ancient Mayan sites that were like overgrown by the jungle and then buried beneath the sediment. That's not what happened at Gobekli Tepe. At Gobekli Tepe, it's like the whole city was there, whatever this is, was there, and then it just like either by hand, people like buried it by hand, or by like some natural event, dirt went and it was all preserved as it is. And when they discovered it, it very quickly became apparent that the whole story of human history had to be rewritten. The problem was that archeologists don't like to do that. 
And so to this day, there's really not a strong understanding. Like no one's really that happy to talk about this. And no one's really trying to like rewrite their version of what the rest of everything, because it's like, ah, this is fucking weird. And then it really doesn't help when like fringy scientists like Graham Hancock point out that like, huh, they got that pillar with all those like weird bag shapes on it at Gobekli Tepe. And Graham Hancock is like a nerd for bags and archeology. span So Hancock was quick to point out that like, hey, dudes over in America, the Mayans had bags. And then dudes over here in like Persia had bags. Like why has everyone got bags? Same bag. Oh, come on. I mean, it's only two examples. That's true, but like they also had bags and they also had bags and they also had bags. These are examples from all around the world. All, all kinds of dudes holding bags and all kinds of ancient art all around the world. It's all, it's all a little weird, like, to be honest. And Hancock was already up on these bags. And then they go and discover this, like, 13,000-year-old city, and it's like, holy shit, more bags. But, like, step back, pause, hold up, hold up. Like, this is an example of a piece of evidence that is, like, that's a weird coincidence. Maybe it's not a coincidence. Maybe it's more than that. Maybe that's data we should all be looking at. Me, who knows? It's a little subjective. So when you see information like this, this is a great example of information that should just be data and you should not reject or deny it. You shouldn't confirm it or like, hold, like it's not necessarily the truth. You know, it's just a piece of information in the puzzle. And now let's quickly pause to talk about our next big idea, the nature of truth. So, so we've talked about the expert bias, the, the, the issue of becoming an expert. Now let's talk about the issue of the fact that we don't know what the fuck's going on. Even before the days of the internet and misinformation and made up stories and AI generated videos and whatever the fuck else, even before all of that, no one really knew what was true or not. You don't, you, you don't know what's going on. You don't know if we're correct about the most basic presumptions we have about the laws of the universe reality and everything. Everything is a little gray. And so when you think about your understanding of the world, it would be unwise for you to think in terms of true and false, black and white, yes and no. You don't know anything. It is much more effective to think in terms of probabilities. Truth is a probability exercise. It's a truth is an exercise of probabilistic relationships. So what, what do I mean by that? We are told that this pyramid was built by a Pharaoh commissioning his people, mostly through slave labor, kind of like, sort of like God worship labor, commissioned this pyramid to have like hundreds of thousands of people devote their entire lives to building this pyramid for his tomb. How likely is that? It's kind of hard to say, like, could be. People have a lot of religious beliefs. Like there's a lot of religion in ancient Egypt. There's a, could be, who knows? But then we're told they achieved it with these techniques. How likely is that, that that's possible? And not only possible, but then like scalable to the speed and size of an operation with which they had to complete all this. And they had to build all these ramps and you know, get all these materials and then take away all the ramps. And then like, like how, how possible is that? Like, is it like a 50% chance that that's the right theory? Is it like a 1% chance that that's the right theory? Like how likely is this theory? And for the longest time, like when I was growing up learning history in school, this was just the accepted theory, not because it's like super likely, because it's like the most unbelievable theory in the fucking world. It's crazy. It's completely crazy. And that's, I think, why it's so cool. But it was the most likely theory because there were no other ways to explain any of it. There was no other theory. It's like that's just by default. That must be the way it was done because like, how the fuck else did they do it? They didn't have the wheel. They didn't have no lasers. They didn't have no nothing, like nothing. They just, just, it just happened that way. And if it just happened that way, then like, what's the chances that this geometric fact was accidental? Or was it, it planned? Because if it was accidental, the chances of this happening accidentally are like one in a hundred thousand trillion. This is just like all the different blocks had to be cut. They all had to be placed. There's like hundreds of thousands of blocks on the inside of the pyramid. Everything is symmetrical. It's all lined up. Like the chance of this happening on accident are not a thing. It's not possible. Like that, that's like an infinitesimal chance. So it's likely that this was intentional, right? So then you go to the like slightly deeper down the conspiracy rabbit hole and you're like, oh, interesting. Like it is a fact 
that the dimensions of the Great Pyramid of Giza directly correlate to the dimensions of the Earth in a couple of interesting ways, in ways that they weren't supposed to know at the time. Like, they didn't have telescopes. They didn't know the diameter of the Earth. Like, yeah, it could be a coincidence. And if it was just one numerical coincidence like that, I'd be like, wow, that's unlikely, but that's cool. But it's a, it's a couple, it, it's like two or three. And, and then suddenly you're like, wait a minute, like, hot damn, that's really unlikely that they did that on accident. But the mainstream understanding is that they did not have the tools to know those things about the earth. So like, how could it be anything except for on accident? And then the same exact logic applies to when like the three pyramids in the Great Pyramid Complex, as well as in a few other places around the world, just happen to be really aligned to the constellation of Orion in the way they're laid, which is like, that's a cool, that could be a coincidence. Like we could, if we were really clever mathematicians, which I am not, we could probably calculate like what's the statistical probability that if you were to build three pyramids nearby to one another, what's the chances that they would just happen to kind of line up with this level of correlation to a constellation and like a pretty prominent constellation, I might say. It's not very likely, but it could be a coincidence. You see how all these things have associated probabilities that you can kind of like gauge how likely they might be. How that probability should inform your level of confidence in whatever narrative you decide to attach to how this came to be. Because you can take the fact, that the thing we can observe, the truth of like, this is what we see or hear or measure or whatever scientific means we use. And then there's an explanation we lay over that which is like, how likely is it that our explanation explains what we're seeing? So all that in mind, when an alternative theory about the history of our planet arose, it provided the opportunity for what might be a far more probable explanation for all these weird anomalies in ancient history than the going mainstream theory. The Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis has been around for a couple decades now, and it's been slowly gaining traction. It was first proposed in this paper by Firestone et al. in 2007. It has since been discussed, elaborated on, and largely corroborated by a lot of peer-reviewed research. And the basic theory is that a piece of or many pieces of a comet seems to have exploded over the North American subcontinent over top of glacial ice during the last glacial maximum or ice age, although technically we're still in the ice age, anyways. And it struck the ice with enough force and energy as to kind of obliterate the North American continent at the time and cause an enormous amount of greenhousing effect from the steam and, and debris in the air. There's a crazy anomalies in the ice and the temperatures of the planet that have been known about for a long time. It's called the Younger Dryas ice or climate event, I guess is what it was called. And science has been wondering what caused it for the longest time. And researchers started to discover things like nano diamonds at a specific layer in the sediment called the black matte layer. They started discovering microspherals, sort of the microspherals, all sorts of evidence that kind of indicates that a comet or a uh, uh, extraterrestrial impact event happened at that time in history, which happens to be 13,000 years ago. And 13,000 years ago happens to correlate almost exactly with like dispersed tales of floods, of like great floods. Cultures all around the world have shared stories of a great flood from like cultures that never talk to each other, like the Bible, but also like North American tribes, also like Africans, also like over in Asia. Everyone's got a flood. And mo a lot of them can't be exactly dated as to when they might have happened, like based upon the storylines of the, the myths around the world. But a lot of them can. And a lot of them correlate to 13,000 years ago. And speaking of things that we already knew and didn't really have an explanation for, there was a lot of megafauna, meaning enormous animals, that used to exist that don't anymore. You probably know about them. And they all happened to go extinct right at the younger dry ass and no one really knew why you know like the movie ice age from disney the saber-toothed tigers the giant woolly mammoths that all went extinct like some of these animals a lot of you guys know about but like did you know that there were gigantic bears there were huge ground beavers with tortoise shells for real 
But my favorite one were giant ground sloths, hands down. This is obviously a, a gra like a recreation, just an image, but this is to scale. This is how big the ground sloths were. Ice Age the movie did not do Sid the Sloth justice at all because it wouldn't have worked if he had been bigger than Manny. But I shit you not, this is a ground sloth skeleton. Oh, and real quick, let's, oh my God, let's do one of the coolest detours ever. Here's a, here's a question for your brain. It's gonna break your brain if you don't already know about this. Fruit evolved so that animals would eat the seeds in the fruit, right? And then poop it out other places and thereby fertilize wherever they're putting that seed down. And then that seed could grow into another fruit tree, fruit plant, whatever it's gonna be, right? You feel me? So all fruit have seeds that evolve to pass through the digestive tracts of the animals that would eat that fruit. That's the whole point of fruit, right? And if there's a, if there's a fruit that doesn't have seeds, remember that that's because humans genetically modified it to not have seeds. All fruit have seeds, that's how it's a fruit. Avocados are a fruit and an avocado pit is a seed. But have you ever wondered what kind of animal poops out an avocado seed? That's right, a giant ground sloth. Avocados are a type of plant called megaflora, as in they evolved alongside megafauna. And their whole, the whole point of avocados is to get eaten by gigantic animals, mostly ground sloths, and then they would poop out avocado pits all over the North America. Ground sloths are native to North America. Avocados are native to North America. Now it's, boom! Anyways, just a fun tidbit that I think about every time I eat an avocado now. I love giant ground sloths, but we're getting distracted. The point is all of these megafauna all went extinct. This chart is weird. You have to read it in this direction. So it's like earlier in history, later in history. So like humans right here, the, the humans on the bottom, fuck you, show my hand. Okay, fuck you, green screen. So the humans are here, right? And the humans, there weren't really many humans in the fossil record and then there weren't many humans and then there was more humans, more humans, more humans. And now it's like, okay, towards modern time. So we're reading it in that direction. So all these megafauna, they evolved, they existed, they existed, they existed, they went extinct. Existed and they went extinct and they went extinct and they went extinct and they went extinct. And the, the going theory for all of this for the longest time was that the Clovis people, the, the people that came to North America across the land bridge and developed into this, you know, this population you can see in gray there, they hunted them all to death. It must have been human predation that when the humans came to this untouched land, just full of gigantic animals that were so easy to catch because they had no instinct to run away from humans because they would never have an instinct to run away. No, like obviously, obviously. And these humans were just such good predators that they literally hunted the giant bears into extinction. That the humans with sticks and stones hunted giant ground sloths into extinction. That, that's the going theory. We're talking an entire continent completely covered in these fucking huge animals, all hunted to extinction. Yet somehow contained within the exact same theory is the idea that the buffalo did just fine. The buffalo just kept on living. Just tons more, lots of buffalo. Because obviously the Clovis people didn't want to kill the buffalo because they would rather kill enormous bears. This is the thing about scientific theories is you have to like look at what you're being told is the theory and then step back and think about like, what does that imply about the other things that are part of the theory? Because if they, they need to all line up. And the theory was that all of the megafauna went extinct because of human predation, mostly. And then maybe a little bit of climate change, like a little bit of that, but like mostly humans hunted them to death, but not the buffalo. And what that implies is that the humans without guns, just, just with sticks and stones, they didn't even have metal, sticks and stones, they decided and succeeded at hunting giant short-nosed bears. This is to scale, they're enormous. They hunted them into extinction while simultaneously just letting the buffalo chill. Buffalo were chilling. Someone make that make sense. And so when scientists started to discover evidence of a comet impact on the North American ice sheet, the Laurentide ice sheet, right at 
the exact point in history when all of these megafauna species went extinct all around the world, but most heavily concentrated extinctions were in North America. Suddenly it's like, oh shit, we have a way more likely candidate for the explanation for this thing than what we had thought of before. You see what I mean? Probabilities. Like, what's the probability that these humans with sticks were able to hunt all the short-nosed bears into extinction? All the saber-toothed tigers hunted into extinction? All the dire wolves, literally dire wolves, hunted into extinction? But not the buffalo. Seems pretty unlikely to me. But if we have super solid evidence, and at this point it's a, like it's pretty solid body of evidence, that there was a comet impact at just that time, at just that place, it's like, that tracks. Like, that is a pretty solid explanation for why we would see this. And then the question is like, why did not all the buffalo go extinct? Like, I don't know. Maybe it has to do with like, what kind of grass they're eating. Maybe it has to do with like, being better evolved to subsist off of like, it, it's hard to say. Science is complicated, history is complicated. I, I don't know. But I know that one theory looks a lot more likely to me than the other. So now, obviously, just like we did with the buffalo and the bears, if this thing is true there, it's true for all of our theories. It's true for all of our understanding. And suddenly, let's revisit Egypt. So you're telling me that there's all sorts of crazy complex structures built all over the world, like literally all over the world, even on little islands and in crazy places with these crazy building techniques that are really hard to explain with modern technology, let alone with primitive stone age technology before the wheel was invented. And they just so happen to all look pretty similar and they all feature like strangely similar symbology and artwork. This is not a, this is not a good example, but they do the research and you find out that all of these societies all around the globe had intimate understanding of the stars and of complex like interstellar phenomenon and, and like time and space relationships that like they shouldn't have really had. Like evidences of technologies involved in building these structures that just don't really line up with them building them in the Stone Age. And you recall that we cannot carbon date stone. We don't know when stone was stoned. Like all we know is when organic matter was put around stone. And all these cultures all around the world have myths about a ancient flood that happened in ancient times that wiped out their ancient ancestors. And we are, we're not just talking about the Bible. We're talking about cultures all around the world. They share themes like there was a great flood that destroyed humanity and destroyed the planet. Or themes like there was fire on the earth and their ancestors had to hide in caves underground or their ancestors emerged from the ground after hiding for thousands. Like there's so many of these similarities throughout these cultural like histories, these oral traditions that just sound an awful lot like surviving the type of climatic events that would happen if a comet hit the earth. And we discover solid evidence that a comet hit the earth. And prior to these discoveries, our best explanation for how the hell these things had gotten built was like, Oh, they just pulled with more dudes, obviously. Like, <laughs> so I think that's all we're gonna go into now because the point is not to prove or disprove this concept. That's not the point at all. The point is to talk about probabilities and to point out that for a long time, this was the most likely explanation because there just weren't like the other explanations were that they were built by aliens, which is possible. It's totally possible. Anyone that says that's not possible is a fucking idiot. Of course it's possible. Fight me. But we don't have any evidence that that's necessarily, I mean, there actually, there is some evidence, but we'll talk about that another time. But the going theory was, you know, it was okay, it was all right, because we just didn't have anything that much better. But suddenly we have a way more likely theory, at least in my mind. If a comet hit the world with enough force to cause the entire planet's global climate to plunge into a deep ice age for a couple thousand years, it's like, Hell yeah, that could destroy a civilization that could build these things. I, th I think the Mexican Aztecs too, but certainly the Maya. The, the going theory is that they came, they built a civilization, they built all these amazing pyramids, and then they farmed their land into basically like, uh, to death. They, they, they turned their land into swamps from all the wood they had to burn to make the lime, to make the limestone. And their forested fertile lands quickly became swamps and they couldn't support their population and their whole population collapsed and then they all just left and abandoned their civilization. 
That's the going theory for how the Maya happened and how these temples got built. That theory right there predicates the fact that when a population surrounding a thing like this, a civilization like this, can no longer sustain itself, it can collapse within 100 years. And, and all the people that were there building these cities, living in this culture, you know, carrying on these beliefs and traditions, they can just like fail to continue to exist. And I can't think of very many things that would more effectively stop a civilization from existing than a fucking comet hitting the earth. So I'm gonna carry it away. But the whole point is to say that the truth is based in probabilities. And most of the most interesting things that we're gonna talk about on this channel, we're not gonna know the truth. All we're gonna be able to do is speculate based upon what seems most likely and what seems less likely. And when we get to these points of like, there's this theory and that theory, and they both have they both could be right. Then, here's the tricky part, then every future investigation that we do, we have to consider both of those points of view of like, maybe this is the story we're learning about, but maybe it's that story. Because like, if aliens are here, if the US government has had contact with aliens, if we have recovered spaceships, or even if we don't, and they're just up there monitoring us or shooting us or abducting us or whatever, if aliens are real, then so many parts of what's happening in the world today mean totally different things than what we are thinking they mean, right? Like, if yes, then all of that needs to be rethought. But if no, then it's this whole other trajectory. And as we learn about modern events, we should be just keeping both of them in mind. Like, you can hold multiple ideas in your head at once as we learn about the world. And that brings us very nicely to outer space and the moon landing. We've already talked about the expert bias, but there are so many other biases that information can have. And not the least of which is political bias, but also monetary bias, social bias. There's so many reasons why someone might try to present something as not what it is. And as a person learning information, it's up to you to try to unpack all the biases that might be involved in skewing the information that you're taking in. And the moon landing is a perfect example of one of these. Quick reminder, we're not making any claims. I'm discussing things, not because I believe or disbelieve them, simply because they're fun to talk about. And it's a great exercise in logical processes, okay? So a bit of background about the space race. The general story goes like this. Russia kicked, sorry, the USSR kicked America's ass at literally every stage of the space race. They launched the first satellite. The USSR was also the first people to kill a dog in outer space because they sent it to outer space, but it didn't come back because that's like a lot more complicated. <laughs> then the US caught up and the US sent a satellite up. Then the USSR beat us to having the first humans in outer space or in orbit. Then America caught up. Then they started their moon programs and they had their first spacewalk. And then America caught up. And then they had their first soft landing on the moon. While at the same time, America was exploding their astronauts on the launch pad. Televised live on national TV. This was a huge tragedy and national embarrassment. Then the Soviets flew to the moon, around the moon, and back to Earth. Then America caught up. And then boom, America beat them. And we got a man on the moon first. And all of this was happening at the height of the Cold War. I think it's reasonable to say that at the very least, there was strong incentive to be the first one to the moon. Even if you weren't actually the first one to the moon, I think we can agree that there would be strong incentive to make the world think you were the first one to the moon. And that doesn't necessarily mean that it was faked. It's just an important detail to keep in mind. And if you don't think that American government would fake something like a moon landing, homie, you should go over to Rumble or Locals where we do the full version of this episode where we talk about just what the American government is willing to do. Because they've done a lot worse things than faking a moon landing. Let's just leave it at that. So to be clear, I'm not making one claim one way or the other about the moon landing. I'm not making claims one way or the other about Great Pyramids, about any... All I'm saying is that <clears throat> there are elements to our understanding that you need to be conscious of, that you need to be thinking about how do I think this way? Why do I think this way? What factors influence the information that I'm getting? And lastly, 
Let's finish with something really fun, just, just because it's fun. And because I think it's an important thing to, to think about when we're, as we start to dive into all sorts of different conspiracy theories here. Let's take a look at the conspiracy chart. This thing was made by Abby Richards, who it's worth noting, makes her entire living off of doing anti-conspiracy and fact-checking journalism for mainstream media outlets. And I'm not saying she's always wrong. I'm not saying she doesn't know what she's talking about. I'm just saying, let's look at her chart. So a closer look here, it's organized at the bottom of things that actually happened, the truth, grounded in reality, speculation line, eh, things that we have some questions about, and then it moves up. Things that are harmless, but definitely false. Things that are false and super sketchy and dangerous. All the way up to the anti-Semitic point of no return. Oh, it's so dangerous. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's start at the bottom. Let's start at the bottom. Let's start at the bottom. Okay, cool. So down here, yeah, good. Cool, right on. So we got things like Fed, FBI spied on MLK. Well, actually, they tried to blackmail him and tell him to commit suicide, but that's a whole other story. COINTELPRO, Watergate, the Tuskegee Experiment, MKUltra, cool. So, so these are things that did really happen. We've got evidence, and I've talked about some of these things on this show before, okay? We have questions. UFOs, Area 51, the JFK assassination, Epstein didn't kill himself. Yeah, cool, all right, all right. I don't know why, like, we live in a simulation. Like, that seems like a slightly different level than, like, Epstein. We live in a simulation is literally unevidenceable. It's unprovable. It'll never be like, it's just a cool theory. It's not a, anyways. But, but here's the interesting trick that she does is that this pink, this pink at line where we're leaving reality. At the pink line, something really interesting happens on this chart. Notice that she's labeled it unequivocally false, but mostly harmless, right? So Avril Lavigne was replaced. Jack's, Michael Jackson is still alive. Greta Thunberg is a time travel traveler. Elvis is alive. The Titanic never sank. Tupac is alive in Serbia. Like, who come, who's ever come up with, these are weird. Like, why is Tupac in Serbia? Like, have you ever heard that specific version of that conspiracy theory? Ted Cruz is the Zodiac killer. Where the fuck did you hear about that conspiracy theory? I've never heard of that. This is like a whole space of conspiracy theories that are kind of irrelevant. Like they don't matter at all. They're not, they're not even like, I don't, like that, that, this is a weird section. In general, I'm not really stressed about this section. Like I don't really care if you believe in cryptids or not. Like I don't, that doesn't affect me at all. Like whatever, whatever. The, the, the point is, then we move up a level, right? So we, we separated this area down here, it's like, yeah, we do have questions about UFOs, thank you very much. To like, ah, yeah, totally, we're on the right track, this is all bullshit, like, okay, what's next? Even more bullshit, even more, wait a minute. Jet fuel, wait, what? Jet fuel doesn't melt steel beams. That is a phrase that comes out of the 9-11 conspiracies, whereby it's very easily provable that jet fuel does not burn at the temperature that would melt steel beams. And lots of experiments have been done that have shown that like, with enough time and enough jet fuel and enough temperature, like over time, the steel beams don't melt, but they can like warp and that can lead to like, bro. But, but that's fair, you know? So what she's saying is that the idea that 9-11 is anything but the official narrative is dangerous to yourself and others and it's absolutely fake. It's totally a denial of reality. She clearly has not done a lot of her own research. And Abby, just so you know, if you wanted, you could subscribe to my Rumble account and I would break down all that evidence for you and you could learn about the conspiracy theories that you're failing to debunk. But we're just getting started and you're probably reading this in the background right now. Soy boys? Like, soy boys? What even is it? That's not a conspiracy theory. Soy is an estrogenic, it's a, it, it mimics estrogen in your body. Soy binds to your estrogen receptors and fucks up your hormone profiles in everyone, especially men. And sure, like, just because you eat soy doesn't mean that you're like a man-boobed, like, feminine gay boy or something. Like, that's not what we're, that's not the, like, what is this? So, <laughs> this is a cultural phrase. This is just a funny joke that has taken hold. And this is a meme. That's not a conspiracy theory. Like, soy is what soy is. And it's not good for you. 5G is toxic. Yeah, I mean, 5G probably isn't controlling your brain with some secret technology, but like, 
5G, there is a lot. I'll, we'll do a video on that at some point. There's like hundreds and hundreds of studies showing that 5G might have some issues when related to your cells. But there are multiple, multiple trillion dollar industries that rely on 5G not being toxic. So don't stress it too hard because it's going to happen either way. doesn't matter. And like, bro, you can't, I, we, we, I, I can't not hide, like, you're right. COVID was probably not a weapon. It was like, let's be clear, YouTube. COVID was not a bioweapon. It also did not come from a lab. There is no evidence that gain-of-function research was involved in any way. And the U.S. presidential election was stolen. I presume I know which one we're talking about. I, I can imagine I know which one we're talking about. And who knows? But to put something that concrete all the way up here in dangerous to yourself and others with like no, as though there was no way to have evidence of such a thing, as though there could be no rational discussion of it. Um, like, have you heard of the Hunter Biden laptop, the Twitter files? Like, that's not what this is referring to, but that affected the outcome of an election. You do realize that the CIA, like the one thing that the CIA is best at is altering the outcomes of elections. That's like what they do all over the world. That's their job. I am not saying that they did that in that election. That's not what I'm saying, okay? I'm just pointing out the mental gymnastics that's going on in this chart. Here's another version of it. Antifa did January 6th. This is where you take conspiracy theory and then you flip it to be what it actually, like a different thing that's not what the conspiracy theory actually states. So then it's like, oh, that's not, of course Antifa didn't do it. The theory is not that Antifa did January 6th, you idiot. <laughs> the theory is that there are certain agencies that are professionals at co-opting mobs, movements, protests. Like it is literally COINTELPRO 101, which is down there in factual, by the way, COINTELPRO right there. The very first rule of COINTELPRO is take an organic movement and then twist it to your needs. I'm gonna leave it at that. And if you're politically upset about that, just think about like the big pallets of bricks that were left out at certain BLM riots and protests and like how that all went. And I'm not saying I'm like, remember, I'm not claiming I believe one way or the other. All I'm saying is that like a rational human might have some questions. But when you put it in this structure, you're not allowed to have questions up here. You are by definition irrational if you have any questions about any of this. So don't question it. Fucking idiot conspiracy theorists, get back down into reality because you're about to cross the line of anti-Semitic point of no return. And then you're really in danger. Then you're screwed. All right, now we're up to the very top of the chart. We're at the anti-Semitic point of no return where she's got the explosion danger sign. It's so bad. And the like, like let's just start right here with the deep state. Then we've got the Illuminati as though they weren't a real organization, which they were, very historically documented. The question is if they still are. Like, what, what does this even mean other than that you're uneducated? Because I, I, don't, I don't know very much about this world, but one thing I do know is that when someone tells you not to ask questions, the first thing I want to do is ask some questions. Like... Why shouldn't I ask about Bill Gates and depopulation? Is, is there a reason why I'm not supposed to ask questions about that? Like, why, why should, I, should I not research the protocols of the elders of Zion? That, that seems like it would be relevant to know about Zionism right now in the world. Right? Like, I know Abby thinks she's making the world a safer place by steering people away from these dangerous topics to research about. But, but this is not how you do it. This is not how you clarify what is and is not real. This is propaganda. And instead of trying to tell people what is and is not real by presenting them with propaganda, it would be a lot more effective to have a conversation where we share evidence and ideas are judged based upon their merit, not based upon what an authority figure tells us to think. Because if you hadn't noticed lately, Authority figures don't have a great track record for telling us the truth about what to think. 
So anyways, let's regroup and figure out where we're at and where we're going from here. This channel has gone through a lot of changes recently. I'm doing a lot of things behind the scenes to make this channel have a life beyond YouTube not monetizing it. If you're watching this video on YouTube, you have just watched the sanitized shortened cut of this video that does not have all the stuff that YouTube will not monetize in it. If you were to watch this video on Rumble or on Locals, you would have gotten the full director's cut of all the stuff that we talk about because we can talk about whatever we want on those platforms. It's great. If you've been following along for a while now, you know that we are in <laughs> forever partway through talking about 9-11 conspiracies and the evidence thereby. That investigation is still ongoing and we will continue and finish that investigation and the rest of that whole line of thought on Rumble, Locals, probably on Twitter, wherever we're not censored. That will not be on YouTube. And if you're on YouTube, we are starting more investigations into just more harmless conspiracy theories that are not, anyways, because I need content that I can make for YouTube that can get my YouTube monetized so that I can continue to do this for a living full time. So there will be all sorts of different content coming out. It's all gonna change a little bit. It's I'm, it's never it's not gonna be some studio. This is just a dude in a room talking to things. Like the audio sucks, the video is what it is. Like we're just hanging out. If you want like some like super Hollywood production, you can go to the channels for that. You got it. I, I honestly, some days I wonder if some of those channels aren't literally CIA programs. Like, like we're gonna do a video at some point on like, the potential psyops that are on YouTube and on TikTok that might be muddying the waters. Cause it's a little weird how like much budget some of these guys have and like the things they choose to focus on with their platform and the thing like, there's some weird stuff out there in the conspiracy theory space these days. But that's topic for another day. For now, I very much appreciate your support. I very much appreciate you sticking with us as I go on through this time of change. The censorship is crazy out here in the internet these days. It's only going to get worse. So all of your support means the world to me. Your support on locals has completely changed my life. I just focus on thinking, learning, working, producing content so we can all figure out what the fuck's going on. People that view this stuff, that share this stuff, that comment on these videos, it means the world to me. If you're not already, please like it. Please subscribe to this. Please drop a comment if you have any thoughts or even if you're dumb and you don't have any thoughts. I just, it's just like, it's such an important time in the world and so much is happening. And if we don't do something, if we don't get involved, if we don't all learn what the fuck's going on, like ignorance is not bliss. Ignorance is an invitation to be exploited and taken advantage of. And the, the there are people that will do that to the world on a mass scale right now and it is not okay. It, it is up to all of us to be a part of the change that we need to happen in the world coming up here, like in the next 10 years, the next two years, the next two months, like shit is going on and we all need to be paying attention. And so I'm doing my best to learn and I'm doing my best to share what I learn with you. And I'm just so grateful that there's a community of people out there that give a shit. So thanks for tuning in. Thanks for helping out. I'll see you soon. Information is the oxygen of a democracy. With Republicans, with progressives, with libertarians, because this is not about right and left, this is about right and wrong. It's so sick that we can't talk about it. It actually lifted up, and it could actually turn. I'm gonna ask you to look away. Legend has it that Christian Rosenkreuz drew his secret knowledge from the wisdom of the ancient Egyptians. They estimated 100 yards from the left wing was this 100 foot disc. You begin to get into this uh, very scary scenario that has to do with the human condition of uh, the proclivity to accumulate vast amounts of power around a handful of people. And right now these misanthropic sociopaths are running the planet into the ground. Now I am become death. The destroyer of worlds. There's so much evidence out there that even if less than 1% is true, that would be enough to collapse the current paradigm and change the whole planet. Our security is at stake.